Good morning! Good morning! morning. Alright guys! Top of the morning to you. Today, finally, how to get rich. <laughs> how to get rich? How do you do it? Well, number one, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten, right? <clears throat> if you do it the same way everybody else does it, you can't get better results. So today we're going to talk about how to construct killer presentations. Presentations that work. When you do this, you will become memorable to your audiences. You will be asked back repeatedly, and you'll have a smile on your face. Because if this is in a company, this is one of the things that gets you promoted. If this is in, if this is your job to make presentations, this is how you make big money. Why? Everyone has 24 hours in a day. But if you become good at constructing and delivering presentations, you can deliver one presentation to many. And instead of one-on-one, -on -one, you can deliver to 30, and you get 15 buyers. Don't you have a smile on your face, Mr. Pistatelli? Of course. Absolutely. <coughs> so this is what Jim Singleton taught me in 1999. And I have to tell you, I was hired by a firm in Louisville to become their first salesperson. I was asked, do you want the north, south, east, or west United States? I said, well, I'll take the south. <laughs> Why? Because it's warmer, and you can work, and it doesn't snow much down there. So, it worked. So then, I was, I was selected because I was already a good presenter. It was one of the criteria. So I said to the CEO, let me go. I'm ready to go. Come on, let's go. He said, no. You have to wait. You have to spend two days with Jim Singleton. <sighs> what a waste of time. One of the best things that ever happened to me. It literally changed my life. When I learned the value of customizing a presentation of personalizing a presentation for every buyer. You know how many salespeople do that? Almost zero. Because most salespeople are lazy. They get their canned presentations, they go into the deck, they say, I'll take this slide, this slide, this slide, this slide. How do they pull the slides out? Because I know how to use them. They're beneficial for me. They aren't thinking about the buyer or the audience. That is the key. You want to rise to the top 20%? Make every presentation personalized to a buyer. And today I'm going to help you understand how to do it. So, number one. The text talks to you about the fact that there are three kinds of presentations. Wrong. There's only one. It's persuasive. How many classes do you sit through that are informative, where the professor is up chucking information, and how hard is it for you to stay awake in that class? Instead, every professor ought to be thinking about the value of what he or she is going to present to the audience first, as a way of getting your attention. Over and over, I've taught you that your future in sales is not about you, it's about them. So how do you create these presentations? One, your presentations should never be canned. Number two, they must all be personalized. How do you personalize them? Okay, here's the formula. This is not in the book. This is Jim Singleton. Okay, number one, you always know what your idea is before you craft your presentation. 
You want to persuade the buyer to do X. That's your idea. Second is you want to make sure that you collect information about the buyer. What do you need to know about the buyer or about the audience? Everything. How do you get this information? Well, thank God the internet's full. You go to LinkedIn, you go to Facebook, you go to Instagram, you go to all those websites and you begin to collect information. Like what? How old are they? Where did they go to college? What do they do for a living? What do they do in their, in, in the non-work time? What do they love doing? What do they hate doing? How long have they worked? How they progressed? As much information as you can collect about the buyer. Now, I'll talk to you a little bit later about why that's important, but collect information about the buyer. Next. You've got your idea. Now the idea that we're going to use today as the example is to help you with your Culligan presentations. So we're going to use Culligan again as the example. The idea is you want to sell a water purification system to a homeowner or a business owner so that their family or their employees can have an unlimited amount of great tasting drinking water. That's the idea. Now, what needs do people have that will be fulfilled if they have great tasting water? What needs? So the need is they don't like the taste of their water. Okay? The need is, and I do need to drink more, but the reason is I don't like the taste. Got it? What's another need? about this. Where do most people get their drinking water? It's not from the tap. Bottles. Bottles. So the need is, I'm sick and tired of bringing those cases of water into my house, into the trunk, into the refrigerator, cold. What do I do with the bottles afterwards? Those bottles create enormous problems. That's a need that Culligan can fulfill. What else? Health. So what's in the water? Do you know what's in the water that you drink from the tap? Say no. 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 You don't know what's in there. Culligan did <coughs> perform a water test to show you what's inside the water. That fulfills the need, am I drinking, is my health going to be at risk <coughs> by drinking water? So first, you identify, Jim Singleton taught me is an abbreviation, is an acronym. He taught me how to SNIB, S-N-I-B, how to SNIB a presentation. And that's the content structure I'm teaching you. Ideas here, needs we've just gone through. Now once a need is fulfilled by the idea, benefits flow to the homeowner. So what need, our number one need that, that a collagen system will fulfill? Provide clean, healthy tap water. Healthy tap water, okay. Now, what is the potential benefit to the buyer? They will remain healthy. 
Keep your family safe. Right? If the water is clean. Got it. Now, when Jordan Yoakum is here, he's going to be the buyer for team number one. Do you know if Jordan is concerned about how healthy his water is? Can you find that out prior to the meeting? Hard. So you know that that's a question you're going to ask to determine whether he has that need. You're not going to assume, you're not going to go in and talk about all the healthful qualities that he's going to get from Culligan unless that fulfills a need. What other need can be fulfilled? Okay. So what needs, we just talked about this, what needs do people have that will be fulfilled if they have a filtration system at home or in their business? Saving money. Saving money. How would they save money? They don't have to buy the bottles at Walmart anymore. So the need is not to spend money frivolously. What's the benefit? They'll have more money, right? they'll have more money to spend on other things. That's the benefit. The other need, Ms. Dean Bergen? Uh, for the water, for having the water in my house or business. Mm -hmm. Did we say something about having to exchange out a huge filter? Oh, from the, from the refrigerator? Is that related? Not related. It could be, could be. So if that's the need, the hassle of having to change the filter, that's a need, could be. Then what's the benefit of that? Not having to change it out. So you never have to worry whether the filter's clogged or not. So when that red light goes on in the refrigerator, you can go, who cares? I don't care about the red light. Block it with a piece of tape. I don't care. But as long as it's blinking, it's, it bothers you. So that's the need that's going to be fulfilled, and the benefit that flows is I'm not going to have to worry about buying a filter anymore. Are you beginning to see the difference between needs and benefits? This is critical. So here's the formula. Ahead of time, you identify the potential needs and the benefits that will flow about the idea, and you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to be making the presentation to Jordan Yoba. What I know about Jordan is he works like a Turk. Every minute is valuable to him. So saving him time is a benefit if he if we can save him time, he's going to be interested. So the number one benefit to Jordan, because he's busy and on the road, is saving time. I'm going to make that the subject. <clears throat> the subject becomes, is the number one benefit. So here's how your presentation starts. After you have built trust, you have built some, some rapport, you set the agenda, you say to Jordan, Jordan, I'm here today to help you maximize your benefit as a salesperson to spend as much time as possible on the road selling. Is that what Jordan wants? Yes! He goes, okay. Now, I know that it's important for you to make every minute count. So I'm going to save you time. Okay, I'm in. How are you going to do that? You should purchase a Culligan reverse osmosis filter, water filtration system at home. When you do, you are going to get this additional benefit. Not only are you going to save money, your family is going to be healthier. You're not going to have to go to the supermarket to buy water bottles anymore. And your family is going to have an unlimited supply right at the tap of great tasting water. Now, is he sold? Say no. No, no he's not sold yet. 
What have I done? What have I done with subject, name, idea, benefit? You skipped. I skipped? You identified a need. That is attention. Yeah. So what is the buy? What is he saying? What is he thinking to himself after I go through subject, name, idea, benefit? What do you think? He gave you this, you go, be sold. Mm -hmm. So you say, prove it. Right? Prove it. Prove you can do this. That's what you want. Now you can begin delivering the evidence. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Need, benefits. All subject need, idea, benefit does for you is it gets the audience's or gets the person's attention. Now, as you walk through your presentation, one idea at a time. Now we haven't talked about talked about trial closes. It's important for you to be, begin to understand what this is. A trial close checks to see if a buyer has heard and or understands what you have just told them. So you've just said to them, a Culligan reverse osmosis filtration system will sit under your sink, out of the way, so it won't cause any hassles. What do you think your wife would think about that? Trial close. Says, would that be okay with you? Yeah, that'd probably be okay. Would your wife? Well, I don't know. She might want to. Might have to make sure we got enough space under there. So all a trial close does is it clears the air and makes sure that the buyer heard what you said so you can go on. If they don't understand it, then you're going to get it on the table then when you should. Instead of waiting to the end when you ask for the order and them saying, no, nah, I don't think so. Then you have to say, well, I'm sure you must have a good reason for not wanting to buy. May I ask what it is? Well, at the beginning, when you explained that, I don't think my wife's going to like it under a counter. You go, why didn't I do that at the beginning? Well, that's what trial closes are for. Keep it simple. Now, in your presentation, to the maximum extent possible, appeal to all of the five senses in your presentation. You got sight. Make sure you don't distract to the eye and to the ear. How many of you, when you smell a particular smell, does it create some event in the past? Right? You smell this, think about your mom's spirits. Smell this. So smells can be important. What's worse is the wrong smell can distract, right? Now, buyers at this point, you've done subject, need, idea, benefit. Buyers are doing this. Prove it. So here are six forms of evidence that you can use to begin supplying the evidence. Now, what is evidence? Ms. Mason, you're a detective. Mm -hmm. What's evidence? It's proof that something happened. Proof. And proof means? In a court of law, a judge <laughs> would say you're guilty. In cold blood. Have you seen the movie, Cold Blood? Oh, it's great. Yeah. Truman Capote. Well, so what was the evidence? Well, one of the killers stepped in the blood in the basement and the imprint of his boot was there. And they tracked the killer down and he had with him the boot that made the print. Guilty. You're guilty. This is what we have to do in the court of law in sales. If we just say something, is that sufficient proof? No! But what if I'm really confident and I say it? No! What, are they stupid? No! You have to prove it. So number one, 
you identify ahead of time all the problems that a buyer is going to have saying yes. You're too young. I haven't heard about the company. I don't think it's going to work. You identify every question that they're going to ask, and then you prepare answers in advance. How do you do it? Here it is. Six forms of evidence. One, an analogy. What's an analogy? You have identified everything you can know about the buyer. The buyer is a golfer. He went to the Masters. He plays every Saturday, every Sunday. Scratch golfer. So when you're trying to explain Culligan, you might say to him, knowing he's a golfer, he doesn't understand the Culligan system that well, so you say to him, well, Mr. Smith, imagine that you've chipped up and you're right on the fringe on the green and you walk up to your ball and there's a piece of mud on it. How hard is it for you to chip up? Oh my God, it's really hard because the bottles are there. So just like that, what we're going to do at home is we're going to remove all the sediment, all the mud from the water so it'll be more healthy for your family. And he says, oh, I get that. Now, have we persuaded him? Not necessarily, but now he understands that we're going to pull the sediment out of the water. If we just say that, it's not as powerful as if we use a story or an analogy. Next, an experience. Now, if you're going to try to persuade someone, which is more persuasive? An experience that you have had or an experience that the buyer has had? The buyer. What do most salespeople do? Yeah, oh yeah, listen, I love it. I didn't have it before. Now my family loves it. As if that's persuasive. <coughs> Second, expertise. You've done your research on your buyer. What expertise does he or she have that will help them understand why this is beneficial to them? What if you have expertise? Is your expertise more persuasive than his? No, his is. But how do most salespeople sell? Well, this, uh, this reverse osmosis, you know, it pulls the blah, 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 and you have bored them to tears. No. Next, an example. An example of this working in your life or their life. Now, it might be that you can provide an example of someone else who's close to them in their situation that might work. The closer, the better. But if they had, had held off making a decision about putting on gutters, and then that washed out the flowers that should have been around the house, then you can say, you have already had the experience. You told me that you should have put, put the gutters on and because, because of the, the, the flowers that were ruined by the hailstorm. So if you put in a Culligan system now, it will, pro it will provide more healthful water to you and your family. You should do it now and not wait. Next, a fact. What is a fact? It is something that exists today and you can cite a source that it's true. Is a fact an opinion? No. But many salespeople sell using their opinions as if that's persuasive. A fact backed up by a reference. The Wall Street Journal reported two weeks ago that blah, 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 got the source. That is a proof statement. And last, and potentially the weakest, overused by finance majors. 
statistics. If you're going to use a statistic, use it this way. Seventy percent of buyers say that they would never go back to their tap water after they've installed a culligan system. I made that statistic up. <coughs> Probably 90. How did I do it? I didn't use a confusing bar chart. No, you've got to keep it simple. Draw it on the board, put a circle around it. As you're doing it, stop talking, because when you're doing it, they're watching you do it. They see the 70%. They look back at you and think, what's 70%? And you nail it. Those are the six forms of evidence that you draw upon to answer every problem they're going to have in advance. How many salespeople do this? Top 20. That's one of the reasons they rise up. Now what's a testimonial? This is another proof statement. A testimonial is a letter an email, a statement, a comment from someone that says that this idea worked for me. And then by definition, you say it might work for somebody else. You can create testimonials from your clients very simply. How do you do it? So a customer says, thank you. You say, oh, you're welcome. What did we do that you, that you really appreciate? Well, what I really appreciated when you put the Culligan system in, is you guys wiped your feet, you didn't track any money, any, any mud into my, into my kitchen. When you were done, you cleaned everything up, and you checked to make sure that, the, that there were no leaks, and I mean, it was just turnkey, I just loved it. So you say, music to my ears. Thank you very much. We try so hard to do that with all of our clients. Could I ask a favor? You take a notes. I've taken some notes here. Could I go back and send you an email on what you just told me? And would you then cut and paste that into a Word document and put that in a letter? Because I'd love to, set, to give that to people as a testament to what we're going to do for them. That's a testimony. Way underutilized, incredibly valuable, especially on your website. Especially when it's got the company's letterhead attached to it. Guaranteed. Way overused. Now, how do you get people really leaning in? Interested, asking questions. The Chinese said this. Tell me, I'll forget. Show me, I'll remember. Involve me, I'll buy. I'm in. I understand. So as many times as possible, you involve the buyer in your demonstration, in your presentation. Second, in business to business, the only reason the core reason that a business buyer will buy is can, will you generate a higher profit for us? I know the accounting majors will disagree with me. But basically, your sales or your revenues Minus your costs, yield your profit from a simplistic viewpoint. So we can either increase their sales or reduce their cost and yield more profit. We have to prove it in business to business. So two ways we can do it. One is return on investment. What you're doing for a company may be a cost until you can explain how you can recover the cost quickly. That's called return on investment. 
So you should not talk about how your product or service is going to increase costs. You describe it as an investment that will be recovered as quickly as possible. If with Culligan, Culligan system costs $29 a month. If a person is spending $30 a month in buying bottled water at Kroger, it's an easy calculation. This will be free to you. It's the same cost, and you get an unlimited supply from the tap, and you don't have to worry about the bottles. Next, some cost-benefit arrangement. Same idea, just interpreted differently. The lower the cost and the higher the benefit, the more the person's going to buy it. The question is, will I really get the benefit? How do you use humor? Number one, never tell jokes. unless you're a comedian, unless you're good at it, unless you've told it a hundred times and you know how to do it and it's right for the audience. There's nothing worse than telling a joke that is, that contains a profanity or it contains something that's off color and shapes how someone in the audience views you or your product. Oh, you're kidding. I wouldn't consider that. Now, is it important for the audience to smile and engage? Well, how do you do that? Well, number one, you tell stories, especially stories that you've lived through. And how do you know if it's going to be funny? You try it out. Presentation number one, you say something and the audience smiles. I used to do this all the time. I couldn't predict it was going to be funny until they smiled. Boy, when I got that one, then I told the same story the same way in the next group, and son of a gun, they smiled again. You've got to get them to, to exude passion and emotion, because people buy first with emotion, and then they, they rationalize the decision using logic. Now, here's a great example of a demo. Years ago, the company invented shatterproof glass. What shatterproof glass means that when it breaks a windshield, the glass doesn't shatter all over the people inside. So the first salespeople for the company were out trying to sell shatterproof glass. So a salesman got a bright idea. He brought in a piece of shatterproof glass to the buyer. He said, sir, this is glass that we've invented that when it breaks, it will not shatter. The buyer goes, oh, yeah, right. So the salesman had a ball-peen hammer in his back pocket, took out the ball-peen hammer and went, wham! The buyer, oh, oh my god. And that salesperson became the number one salesperson in that year. So the president asked him at the, at the annual meeting, stand up and tell our salespeople how you did it. So sure enough, he explained it. And, this, and the president of the company handed out ball-peen hammers to every salesperson and says, guys, go after it. Let's increase their sales. Number one salesman says, hmm, how am I going to become the number one salesman next year? So he figured it out. Didn't tell anybody, but his numbers were great. So the president said, how'd you do it? He said, put me up front. I'll explain it. So the salesperson says, what I did, guys, is I put the piece of glass on the table. I said, this is shatterproof glass. I guarantee it won't shatter. He said, I took out the ball-peen hammer, and I gave it to the buyer. And I let the buyer hit the glass. And I doubled my sales. The final note involved the buyer. The more you involve the buyer, in the demonstration, the more they lean in. Now, we've talked about how important it is to appeal to the heart as it is to appeal to the brain. We've talked extensively about the importance of you smiling in your presentation. How do you do it? Just like the waitress does. You look at every person and you say to yourself, I like you. 
You don't say it, you think it. Next, make sure your vocabulary contains strong words that appeal to people. It used to be we could use the word free and it would appeal to people. Now in emails, if you ever click on anything that says free, you know what's going to happen. It's going to go to some spam site and get you in trouble. Because we know now that nothing is free. But strong words such as you. Not I, but you. People respond well to you and they respond well to advantage. They respond well to new. They still do. And they respond really well to benefits. Key strong words to make sure they're in your presentation. Now let's watch a presentation. This is a sales presentation by an acknowledged by a celebrity in a movie. So let's see how effective this presentation is. Could you shut the front light off, Mr. McGinnis? <clears throat> What he's trying to say is that uh, our new brake pads are really cool. You're not even going to believe it. Like, um, let's say you're driving along the road with your family, and you're driving along, la, 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 woo, and then all of a sudden there's a truck tire in the middle of the road, and you hit the brakes. Whoa, that was close. <laughs> now let's see what happens when you're driving with the other guy's brake pads. You're driving along, you're driving along, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling in the backseat, I gotta go to the bathroom, Daddy! Not now, damn it! <laughs> I can't stop! <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a cliff! Oh, and your family's screaming, Oh my God, we're burning! Alive. <laughs> no, I can't feel my legs! Here comes the meat wagon! Wee -hoo, wee -hoo. And the medic gets out and says, oh my god. <laughs> New guy's in the corner puking his guts out. <laughs> All because you want to save a couple extra pennies. And <laughs> to me, it doesn't get out. Now, do you validate? No. <laughs> Not the best evidence of a present of a demonstration. Thank you, Chris Farley, the late Chris Farley. All right, so we talked about presentations individually, a little bit about groups. Now let's focus in on the things that we need to, to make sure we do when we present in groups. Why are these valuable? Because you can sell 30 people in the same amount of time it takes to sell one. Number one, you have to understand roles of people in the audience. The first one is to know who the decision makers are. Is the decision maker the president? Could be. How would you know? You gotta do some digging ahead of the presentation. Could be that this, this chief financial officer mm. is gonna be the final say to make sure it's in the budget, even if the president wants it. Make sure you know who is in the room. That means know everybody in the room. Most salespeople don't do it. They just show up and they wing it. And that's why most of them fail. Know everybody in the room ahead of time. Second, in addition to the demographics, where they live, what they do, Determine as best you can what their disc style is. Is this an I? Now, in, your, in the midst of your presentation, you can infer this if you'll just smile at the right people. And when they smile back, chances are you got a high eye. Much better if you can do it in advance. Then you want to uncover how motivated they are. What motivates them? We've gone over this in your assessments. There are seven key motivators. When you can figure out how someone is motivated, you can go down that street to pick them up. 
Now, now you're thinking to yourself, you have to do all this just to make a presentation? Well, no. If only if you want to sell every presentation. About seven years ago, I started working with Mr. Singleton and I. I started working with a company in Cincinnati, a financial services firm. The problem they had was they were winning less than 5% of their presentations, a finals presentation. But they meet a committee. There are three different companies who make a presentation to a committee. The committee names one after a critical presentation. Less than 5%. We taught them what Jim Singleton taught me and what I'm teaching you. How do you craft a presentation that's persuasive and how do you deliver it in a way that doesn't distract the buyer? A year later, they were winning 40%. And absolutely tickled. I still work with them. And they're still doing it. All right. Now, how do you make sure that your presentation goes as it's supposed to go? The devil's in the details. So what you have to do is you have to call in advance. You have to make sure everything is set, the time. All of you low C's, stop it. You gotta call. You gotta make sure every detail is right. <coughs> Because there's nothing worse than you getting there and something is wrong that you can't fix. And you make a presentation standing someplace where you can't, you can't be persuasive. All right. So call in advance, make sure the time's right. Arrive half an hour to an hour early. Now, this is a general principle that all great salespeople use. Why? Because you're going to learn something in that half an hour. You're going to meet somebody. You're going to create a relationship with a receptionist or an assistant to the president that's going to help you in the future. Get there early. Next, make sure you get to the room early and look to see how the room is configured. Many times a speaker has the say to determine how the room will be configured. Jim Singleton tells an old story about him delivering a presentation at, what's the best golf course in California? Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach. That was at Pebble Beach. So Jim had the morning session. All the people came in in their golf attire. And where did they sit? Back of the room. Nobody up here. Singleton. Says, good morning. Walks to the back of the room, <coughs> turns around, and asks them to turn. So now he's at the front of the room. So you can control the presentation area. Next, make sure all your equipment is in great shape. Back in the old days, before we had laptops, we had laptops. We had no way to display a PowerPoint out of a laptop. So a company invented a piece of glass in kind of a picture frame that and it was connected to the laptop so you could take the PowerPoint to the frame, you could put it on an overhead projector. And then the overhead projector would show the image on the screen. It was brilliant because nobody could project PowerPoint. I took it on the road, but I had had my own overhead projector, my own projector, all the computer, all the equipment, and I went through the airport like this. Why? Because I wanted to win. So make sure you have all your equipment. Next. Practice, 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 practice. Practice doesn't make you perfect. But it makes you better. And say to yourself, what I've said to you over and over and over. Make your next presentation the best one you've ever delivered. Over and over. When you do this, you will arrive in the top 20%. Now, you've got to prepare yourself to win your presentation. 
The optimal length of a presentation is six minutes. Why? You will lose attention after that. That is the longest you can speak and maintain the attention of the group, regardless of how charismatic you are. You've got to get them involved. So ahead of time, you've identified all the problems they're going to have with saying yes to your idea. And the speaker always speaks and maintains these three critical elements. Control, credibility, and confidence. You must maintain all those three in your presentation. Now, at some point, at the end of your six minutes, you've made the case for why the person ought to, or the audience ought to buy a Culligan reverse osmosis filtration system for their home. You step back, you, you conclude by saying you reiterate the need plus the idea and all the benefits. And then you say, with a smile, are there any questions? Because it's in the Q&A that you win. Why? Because they're interested. You've offered the proof. they got a couple questions. So you, you offer to answer any questions. Now, how you do this is critical. Now, we're going to go over this in depth in 425. Right now, I'll give you the steps. So first of all, when you raise your hand and say, now, are there any questions? What happens in the mood in the audience is you have to shift it. It's been all about you. Now you have to make it about them. You've been in lots of settings where someone says, do you have any questions, and what happens? Nothing. People sit there like a bump on a log. So you always have to have two softball questions ready to ask. So raise your hand. Any questions? You know, I, was, I had a presentation last week in Ottawa, and there was a young lady that sat right there that asked this question. Blah, 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 blah. Pause. Now, softball, you knock it out of the park. Great answer to a question that you offer. The audience goes, huh. Any other questions? If there's still not a question, you got your second one. So you get that softball out, you knock it out. Great answer, and then there's going to be somebody in the room that's going to say, oh, listen, Buster, stop all these softball answers. What about this? We thought through all of those problems. Here's how you do it. You listen intently to the person's question. Eyeball to eyeball. Never break. Once he's finished, you break eye contact. You repeat or rephrase the question. <coughs> you repeat if you want to answer it. If you don't want to answer it, you want to answer another question, you rephrase it. The person says, your performance last year was lousy. Why should we think the next year should be any different? How do you rephrase? You'd say, the question on the floor is, what have we done in the past year to make sure that this year's performance is spectacular? Answer that question. You're in control. You break eye contact, and, and the answer to the question is a presentation to the audience. You don't do this back and forth. And when, you, when you've answered the question to your satisfaction, you don't go back and say, did I answer it? That puts the person in control. You're in control. You say, now, are there any other questions? Now, what if this person is doing this? Avoid. Unless she's the decision maker. If she's the decision maker, I'm right back to her. If not, because haven't you been in question and answer sessions where the speaker and another person go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you think, what the hell is this for? So if you do get someone who's persistent, you can say to them, ma'am, I can tell you have lots of questions about culling systems. Would you mind if you and I kind of got together after the presentation, and then I'll answer every question I have? Oh, that'll be fine. Now, I 
can entertain questions from everyone else. Right, that's a little brief on how you do Q&A sessions. Listen. The best presentation. Question. I'm just confused about the softball question. Is that you bringing up your own question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I was confused. Offer a question that you know the answer to. Okay. <coughs> All, all you're trying to do is give the audience time to think about the questions they want to ask. Now, the best presentation is no presentation at all. It's whatever you have to do to get the people in the audience to ask you the appropriate questions that once you answer, get you the business. My friend Steve Mullen was making a presentation to a particular group, and he was third, and it came down to, he was, he was supposed to have 20 minutes to make his presentation, and he was last, so the, the facilitator came in and said, I'm real sorry, the other guys took up too much time, you've only got five minutes, do you want to reschedule? He said, no, I'm ready. He walked in and he said, I've got five minutes. My question is this, what do you need to know about us to make a decision that we're the ones who should manage your assets? Question, question. I got the business. So you see, short presentation, get them to a point that they ask the good questions. Once you answer it, you got it. So today, we began with this notion. You want to become rich from the perspective of Napoleon Hill. If you've read Think and Grow Rich, it's about how to become a richer person, richer in knowledge, richer in experience, and with additional money in your bank accounts. Learn how to differentiate yourself from all the other schmucks by customizing every presentation. When you customize presentations, you're going to be memorable, you're going to be asked back, and you're going to feel great about yourself. Any questions? Team two. So on team two, the parts of this presentation, subject, need, idea, benefit, are not in the text. Yet, I want someone to tackle this concept. Because this is what you're going to apply in your final presentations. You're going to apply this in advanced personal selling. Okay? See you on Friday.